I performed in over 400 Nutcrackers. I was selected to perform in the opening ceremonies of the Olympics. So I had really great opportunities and I was selected to go perform in New York City. That's every dancer's dream. But instead of finding myself in these once in a lifetime performances, I landed in the ER and I had no idea what was going on. I thought that I was having a heart attack. After a whole bunch of tests, the neurologist just said that I was underfed and over exercised and that I just couldn't continue doing what I was doing. Welcome back for another episode of the Beyond the Scale podcast. I am your host, Mary Catherine, and today we have Dr. Ashley Lucas, who is the owner, founder, and advisory consultant for PhD Weight Loss and Nutrition. She has over 15 years of education in the field of nutrition and metabolism. In her mid-20s, she retired from her professional ballet career to start her own practice. While understanding the importance of nutrition that it played on her own sports performance, she went on to earn her PhD in sports nutrition and chronic disease from Virginia Tech. Her research throughout her six-year postgraduate doctoral training focused on energy metabolism and the female athlete triad. She was awarded the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetic Scholarship and completed her dietetic internship at The Ohio State University. She passed the national examination registering her as a dietitian, offering experts expertise in food, wellness, and nutrition services. Dr. Lucas is a nationally renowned speaker, columnist, and leading expert in the field of weight management and behavioral change. Through a scientific method that focuses not only on the metabolic consequences of fat gain, but also on the behavioral and psychological aspects, she created and continues to innovate the PhD approach, which has helped thousands of people nationwide achieve their peak wellness once and for all. So welcome to the podcast, Dr. Lucas. Thank you so much for having me. I'm sorry that's so long. <laughs> Okay. No, it's great. And I, I love to read, you know, everything that I have about you just so that our listeners really know who we are talking to today and know how qualified you are and just like, you know, set them up for understanding that they're going to learn so much and get so much value from this episode. Oh, well, I hope so. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. So I want to start out with what inspired you to study what you did in college and then, you know, take that leap of faith and start your own business in it. So if you could just kind of walk us back to those beginning stages. Sure. Um, well, as my bio states, I was a professional ballet dancer and I was put in it by my mother when I was really young. I was about three years old and I didn't have much natural talent. There were so many girls in there that their bodies were just naturally lean. They were really great at it. And that was definitely not my story. And so I have the type of mindset and attitude if someone tells me I'm not good at something or I can't do it, I'm going to show them that I can. I, I love to prove the naysayer wrong. And so I just pushed my body. I pushed myself to conform to the expectations, but it was always a big struggle. I counted calories like crazy. I remember having eight hour days of dancing, which was really physically intense, and then going to the gym after to get on the elliptical machine to burn more calories. And despite all of that effort, I was told that I was fat countless times. I didn't get a lot of the roles that I probably would have if my body would have been where it needed to be. Uh, and as a result of this chronic restriction and um, trial and error that wasn't necessarily healthy, I had injuries and stress fractures throughout my dancing career. And I had a successful, fairly successful career just because I'm so obstinate and I push myself like crazy. So I was able to dance with uh, professional ballet companies across the country. I performed in over 400 nutcrackers, but I probably had one or two stress fractures in my feet during all of those. I was selected mm. to perform um, in the opening ceremonies of the Olympics. So I had really great opportunities. And the end of my dancing career happened when I was selected to go perform in New York City. 
You know, that's every dancer's dream. Everyone wants to land there. But instead of finding myself in these once in a lifetime performances, I landed in the ER and I had no idea what was going on. I thought that I was having a heart attack, but after a whole bunch of tests, the neurologist just said that I was underfed and overexercised and that I just couldn't continue doing what I was doing. And so with that, I, I flew home. I was fearful of my health future. I didn't know what to do. I mean, dancing was my identity and it might not sound like much, but it was 20 plus years of struggle and sacrifice. It was everything I knew who I was. It's like Michael Phelps being ready to jump in and go to the, you know, do his Olympic swim and being pulled off and carted to the ER instead, you know, it was devastating to me. And so I had to figure out what to do. And I understood how significantly nutrition or really lack thereof um, impacted my own sport performance. So that's when I went to school. I went to Virginia Tech and I earned my PhD in sports nutrition and chronic disease. And I did that because I wanted to learn exactly what was happening in the body and to help people drop the weight, but not just ruin their body and meta metabolism simultaneously like I did. I understood how significantly mindset, the mental, emotional habits, behaviors, how that impacts our body and our well being and our physiology as well. So I wanted to study that. And that's what I did. And so I was figuring out what's going on and how can I help people overcome the challenges that I went through as an athlete. And I went on and I taught at the Ohio State University. And there I recognized that I'm not a patient person. I love research and base everything that I do off of it, but I need to see dramatic, quick change in people to be satisfied. So I went back to school again to become a registered dietitian because I thought that's what I needed to be a true expert in the field of weight management. But there I realized I was being taught all the same stuff that I implemented when I was dancing and didn't see success, you know, eat less and move more, eat everything in moderation, every food fits, it just requires balance, all of these things, avoid dietary fat, eat a really high carb diet, it just didn't work for me. So I ended up doing, yeah. continuing my research, flipping everything upside down, doing quite the opposite of what I was being taught mixed with my research for my doctoral work and put together what today is the you know called the phd approach and started working a lot with athletes specifically and helping them optimize performance be faster be leaner and what i ha found had a profound impact on athletes had an even more significant impact on individuals struggling with excess fat weight and so that's how it cr was created. And so far we have about five brick and mortar locations an amazing nationwide over the phone program where we have clients in every state. We have over a thousand maintenance clients right now that we're able to serve and help to transform their lives. So that is my journey as to how I am where I am today. Oh, I love it. And I have so many questions. And the first one is what is the PhD approach? It just... If you could give us an overview. Sure. Yeah. So the, the first thing is understanding how the body works when we look at fat. So now we understand that the fat cells in the belly, which we call visceral fat, these fat mm -hmm. cells are actually really active and they secrete hormones at the fat cell level. So what happens for most folks is once they accumulate fat, it starts to build up in the belly. And this visceral fat isn't the stuff that you can melt or freeze or sculpt off, but it's the stuff that's deep down in the organs, right? It fills up the organs, it wraps around them, it squeezes the organs tight. And over time, this fat mass actually grows its own blood vessels. It gets a little oxygen supply going for it and it secretes hormones and the hormones that it secretes helps it with its one objective. And that objective is for that fat mass to get fatter as fast as possible. It's all it wants to do. So it's like its own entity. It has demands and urges and cravings and it slows your metabolism. It, it makes you have crazy cravings where there's no willpower that will overcome it makes you really much more hungry than you should be. And it, and it makes you lazy because the last thing this fat mass wants you to do is go and spend a ton of energy. So I, I want folks to be able to look at this belly fat like a tumor in a way. 
and all it wants to do is grow. So what we do at PhD is we assess how much belly fat you got and make sure that we're going to get rid of it and we're going to collapse that visceral fat. Where most programs you come in, you say, gosh, I think I'd like to drop 20 pounds, but you've really got, let's say, 50 pounds of this excess fat weight in the belly. And I also find that we drop weight in the opposite direction that we put it on. So if you put it on in the belly first and you only lose 20 pounds, well, that, last, that first fat mass that came on in the belly is still there. So you still got 30 pounds of this excess fat weight secreting all these hormones working against you, and you're at a really high risk of putting the weight back on. So that's why mm -hmm. with us, the first step is figuring out where is that sweet spot? Where is that optimal weight? After we've determined that, we then create a customized meal plan for our clients that guides them on exactly what, when, and how much to eat. So we take out the guesswork. It's not ambiguous at all. It's super precise. And our clients love that they understand exactly what they should be doing. And everybody's different. Each metabolism is different. Your health history is different. So we make sure that we are customizing that meal plan. And then what we like to do is provide about 80 to 85% of the food for the week. And there's no cost associated with the food. It's just a part of it. And for our at-home clients, we ship them the food and cover shipping. And it's not like Blue Apron or HelloFresh where it's like fresh frozen, but it's individual serving sizes like a protein-based oatmeal that you might eat for breakfast or a soup that you would add hot, add hot water to and add some veggies and healthy fats in the amounts that we talk about. Maybe a protein bar for a snack or something like that. Or you can always just use all of your own food, but no matter what, dinner meal is going to be your responsibility because I want you to become an expert at one meal at a time. And that's the purpose of the foods that we provide are just a beginning helpful tool to get you on track and to understand when you're full and when you're hungry and what food should look like and what portions look like. And I mm -hmm. also then can manipulate the macros so that I can get each client into a state of fat burn, uh, not keto, but just right there where they need to be so they can start to tap into the stored fat. And that's how we go. So then from moving forward, they have a coaching session with one of our nutritionists every week. And that's where we continue to tweak the meal plan. So we see continued changes. We gradually release our foods as they're practicing and becoming confident. Um, we talk about nutrition education from this very unconventional viewpoint. We never count calories. And we alternate nutrition with a lot of behavior work um, because, again, that's coming from my PhD understanding that we've got to focus on the mind. For a lot mm -hmm. of people, dropping weight is an addiction recovery process, so we've got to be able to tackle all of that and what that includes. And then once we get the body where it needs to be and have fully collapsed that belly fat, that's when folks enter into maintenance and maintenance, I think, is the most important part. We never leave our client's side. Um, our care is free at that point, and they just have availability to us, checking in with us and making sure that they're doing well on that second phase of the journey. So that, in a nutshell, is what we do at PhD. Mm, I love it so much. And, and, it, and it really sounds like to me that you take an individual approach to weight loss and to fat loss yeah, versus definitely. here is this you know, blanket weight loss program that we've created and everybody just gets under it and, and does the same thing. I also love how you mentioned that you don't practice counting calories. Tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about your thoughts around that and why. Well, the body is so much more complicated than calories in and calories out. We're not regulated by calorie sensors. We've got body chemistry in there. We've got hormones. We've got our mindset and our emotions, our thoughts. More and more research is coming out about how our thoughts impact our body physiology. Like they actually enhance or reduce the amount of leptin and ghrelin, which is our full and hunger signals those hormones, how we think about food actually influences if we're going to secrete more hunger hormone or more full hormone. So we've, we've got to take all of those into play there. So calories don't mean much to me. If we were to count calories and just do it by that, it would be like saying that all calories are equal. And that right. would be like saying, well, if you were to walk a mile, it really doesn't matter. Your experience is going to be the same with any kind of mile. But it, you know that your experience would be different if I told you to walk up a hill for a mile 
or down a hill for a mile or on a flat road for a mile. Your experience would be completely different. And that's how it is with calories. If I told you to eat 100 calories of a banana or 100 calories from an egg, your experience would be totally different and your body chemistry would also be different. And the person who ate the 100 calories of eggs, I would say, would have a better experience and better body chemistry as a result. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. And I do feel that this is being talked about more recently is the calories in and calories out. Like it's not as easy as we think. And for me, like starting this venture as a gym owner and, and a fitness coach, we, I very much learned in my traditional, you know, courses for being a certified trainer. Like it, you know, if you want to lose a pound, like this is how many calories you have to burn. This is how many calories that you mm -hmm. have to eat. And it doesn't really work like that for everyone. And that's hard to wrap your head around when you thought it was supposed to be this way. And people think like, okay, well, it's science. This is the way it should work. But sometimes it just doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about why you can't out train a bad diet? Because I, I know that you definitely believe that. <laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, so I think that exercise is so important and it's important for mood and, and sleep and stress and your heart health and, and overall body. Like we're not going to achieve this high level of greatness if we don't move our body. I mean, that's what we're here in this physical form and it's meant to move. So I'm not discounting that at all. And it's one of my non-negotiables is to move every day. But exercise is much more of a wellness tool than a weight loss tool specifically. You know, you would have to cycle 1,000 miles or run 350 miles to burn just 10 pounds of fat. So that's really why you can't out, you know, outpace a bad diet. And, you know, exercise is a huge appetite stimulator. It makes us really hungry and we can so easily, I think it's unbelievable how easily you could eat 800 calories so easy. You could do it in what, two, two minutes, less, probably a minute. It's so unfair. And then you would have to work out all day to be able to burn that. So you've got increased hunger. I think all of those trackers are pretty inaccurate. So here we think we've burned all these calories and that a calorie is a calorie. So I should be able to eat all these super frustrating. It doesn't necessarily work that way either. You know, so, so that, that's why I really believe that you've got to focus on good nutrition. I, what is another like trite phrase? I think ab start in the kitchen or something like that. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's a, such a great point because, you know, I have a Apple watch and I'll do a strength workout and I'll feel like I'm dying at the end of this 30, 45 minute workout. <laughs> and I'll look at my watch and I'm like, oh, it says it all. I only burned 200 calories. Like, how is that possible? And then I'm really, really hungry throughout the day. I'm like, how could I be so hungry? I only burned 200 calories. And it's so inaccurate. It really is. And we yeah. rely on these things way too much than we should. I agree. So what, what do you think with the clients that you work with today? What do you think is like the number one thing that people struggle with the most when it comes to fat loss and just keeping it off for, for the long term, for the long game? I think we often go back to the old habits that got us to the unhealthy place to begin with. We think that we're doing this thing and that it's a diet and that we'll do and make all these sacrifices during the diet period. And then mm. we just get fed up. We're exhausted with it because it's something that's not necessarily sustainable. And then we get there. I always say like, if you get into maintenance, you hit your optimal weight and you go celebrate with an ice cream cone or a trip to McDonald's, like you're not going to be set up great for maintenance. Like I'm concerned for you and your maintenance success. Right. It, this really has to be a lifestyle and that's what we focus on. And, you know, if you go to our website and read our reviews, you'll see so many people that say mindset, that say lifestyle, that say it changes the way they think about food. So we look oftentimes at weight loss as just about the food, what and when we're eating, but really your emotions are tied to it. I always say that weight loss is a process of letting go. It's letting go of the excess mm -hmm. fat weight that's no longer serving you and all of those emotions that are tied to it. And if someone just looks at it like the food, let's say they, you know, there's all these drugs out there, these injections, and they just take that and they're just interested about the weight. 
and the weight drops down, but all of these old emotions or trauma or whatever that might be are still up at the heavier weight level, if that makes sense, then the weight's going to track back up to meet the mindset and those emotions. So no matter what you're doing, um, if, if you're focusing on the food, you also have to focus on the emotions so they can meet at the same level. And that's the only way that you're going to be able to maintain a weight loss for the long term. Yeah, definitely. And the, taking it as a lifestyle approach. And I think, too, it's it's valuable to note that you can't do something that's so extreme that you're not going to be able to sustain it for a lifetime and, and fit into your mm -hmm. lifestyle. Because I feel there are people at the gym that we see that make that mistake is they try to take on this, this new, you know, diet, like intermittent mm -hmm. fasting or a keto diet. And they think, oh, this is going to be the, the win all, this is going to be the, it's going to fix all of their problems diet. But I'm like, can you sustain this for more than the 30 days that you're going to do this? Like, are you going to be able mm -hmm. to do this forever? And mm -hmm. a lot of times we can't. And so I think it, it is like you mentioned, it's, it's a lifestyle and you have to take it at that approach when you start anything new. Yes, definitely. Can you, you mentioned this briefly, can you talk to us a little bit about the weight loss injections that you're seeing people talk about? And, and I have seen it more recently with celebrities, like celebrities mm -hmm. are, you know, they're saying, oh, well, this person's taking Ozempic or you know, some of the other ones out there. I don't even know what they're called. What are some pros and cons of those? And then like, who actually qualifies for that? What is like someone who is a real good candidate for that? And then is there a certain type of person that really should not be considering weight loss injections? Yeah, those are, are great thoughts? questions. So um, really, I think it's now it's omnipresent. I think everyone is taking those injectables, not just celebrities. I was at the doctor the other day and they were filling a script for some kind of lotion for me. And they're like, well, this might be about four weeks until you get it because all of the pharmacists are busy filling these injections across the country. So I, I really think it's everywhere. And then actually, I think the CDC or Department of, of Health is trying to get kids to either for because obesity hasn't just increased for us as adults. It's increased significantly for children as well, specifically between the ages of five and 11. And now they're saying that surgery and taking these injectables is treatment for childhood obesity, which just blows my mind. And so these drugs are, most of them are diabetes drugs, and they're made to help people regulate their diabetes, but they found as a result of it, it was helping these folks drop about 15% of their weight. And so what we found over time with more and more people taking it, that most people do see a maximum drop of about 15% of their weight that they're carrying, and it takes about a year to achieve that. And then if you stop taking that drug, well, then the weight comes back on. Most insurance companies aren't covering the cost of it quite yet. I don't know what's going to happen there. And the cost out of pocket for a lot of people is about twelve to $16,000 annually. And since this isn't really a lifestyle change and you've got to keep taking it, this isn't a once a time cost, right? It's something that you're going to do every, every year. So now people are getting it off of the black market. And I, I just, I see so many people, thousands of people uh, drop weight without this type of medication, without needing it. So I know that people can do it without. Um, we're yeah. also finding that a lot of the weight that is dropped, about two thirds of it is muscle. And that's a huge issue because you know, muscle is, is so key. And as we age, oftentimes our muscle just naturally drops because we start shifting our diet. We don't move as much. There's a few reasons why, but that is the last thing you want to have happen because muscle mass is your marker for longevity. It's your metabolic currency. It's even a little bit dangerous to drop too much weight if you're, you know, up in your 70s because you lose muscle mass with that if you're not careful. We really focus on just dropping the fat and really minimizing the amount of muscle that's lost. But with these drugs, now we find that people are getting lighter, but they're getting fatter. So you get off these drugs, you have less muscle mass. If you haven't learned any behavior change behind them, then you're really not set up for success. And then we're also finding that it elevates heart rate and Anything that elevates heart rate long term is usually not a good thing. No. So I, I would just be 
cautious. I'm always cautious on everything that comes out that is something exogenous that we've got to take. And again, since I see great success without it, I don't think it's necessary, but it is a tool. And if someone has, you know, 300 pounds or a significant amount of weight and they just need to see motivation and jump start, then perhaps it could be helpful there in that situation. If someone really has type two diabetes, it can be helpful there. Where I wouldn't suggest it no matter what is if you've just got about 20 or 30 pounds that you wanna drop, or you just wanna drop a little bit of weight to fit in your bikini or look good for spring break, the cons are not worth the pros. And you can definitely make those changes through changing the way that you eat and think about food. So I definitely wouldn't recommend it if you've got about that much to drop. And I would definitely consider other options even so if you've got more. Yeah, I think that's a great point that you mentioned that you can lose muscle too. And why would you wanna lose muscle? But that's, that is your key to longevity, as you mentioned. Do you think it's because people are losing weight so quickly? Is that why that's happening? Or is it because their lifestyle is not congruent to continue to build muscle? Like they're not working out. They're not, you know, taking it as like a health and fitness journey. It's like, they're just looking for the quick fix. What do you think it is that's making that happen? A little bit of both, but one of the major side effects, one of the reasons why it works is because it makes you really nauseous and it makes you not want to oh. eat. So people are just eating less. Really, it is a tool. It doesn't speed your metabolism. It doesn't do anything like that. It really works because you just don't want to eat. A lot of people vomit or have diarrhea. Um, so, uh, but most people just feel really nauseous, kind of tired, worn out, kind of like when you have the flu or you have morning sickness, yeah. that's what it feels like. So people just don't eat as much. And when you don't eat enough protein and you don't feel great, you're not going to move a lot. So you right. lose muscle. It's just like, imagine if you have the flu, that's what, yeah. that's what it feels like. And you lose muscle and, and stuff like that. So if people could feel better or if they feel okay and they can make sure they get adequate protein and lift weights, then maybe they could overcome those negative ramifications. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I would want to feel like that all the time. There's, there's no yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. I have a, um, my, I have a, a family member who just doesn't want to change his lifestyle. Um, and I swear whenever you're an expert at something, you have a family member, they're just the hardest. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So, you know, he um, has high blood pressure. He's type two diabetic. He's like, I just don't want to change my lifestyle. I just know I need to get some of this weight off me. It's killing me. And so yeah. he takes it and his wife just calls him like Mr. Grumpy. He's so grumpy all the time. He just doesn't feel good. And she, she's glad that he's dropped weight, but she hates that he's taking it and would prefer that he just let it go because he's not a yeah. happy person to be around. Mm, yeah. I don't think I'd be able to to do that. What, what are some of the most common chronic diseases that you've seen people reverse with, with working with you and your program with proper nutrition and exercise? So many things. And it's my favorite part about what we do. Um, type two diabetes, we're able to put that into remission for a lot of people. I had a 73 year old Richard who uh, put his type two diabetes, he was insulin dependent. He put that into remission, no more insulin, no more medication and regulated blood sugar levels in six weeks at 73 years old. Uh, another client, John, who was on 40 four units of insulin a day. Within two days, he needed to drop the insulin needs in half. Within two weeks, he dropped it in half again. Within about four weeks, no longer needing insulin. Even with type 1 diabetics, we have an awesome client, and he's been able to reduce his insulin significantly. And we know that we don't want to have high insulin. It's an inflammatory type of hormone. It promotes fat storage. So it's a, a big issue. We don't want to have a lot of insulin in the body, and type 2 diabetics, a lot of them need to take it. So we're able to do that for a lot of people. Um, high blood pressure is a pretty simple one to be able to reverse for most folks. That's a lot of fun. 
sleep apnea is another big one. I've recently been looking into a lot of, of brain health and what we can do. And sleep apnea, not sleeping, significantly reduces our brain health as we age. It's like one of the number one things. So if you think you've got sleep apnea, you definitely want to go and get treated for it. But the positive thing is, is if you have excess fat weight and you can let that go, you can reverse sleep apnea for most folks and get off that big CPAP machine. Um, mm. Even autoimmune conditions. I chatted with another client. She came in, she was just in pain. She had an autoimmune condition. She thought all of her symptoms were related to that, which they probably were exacerbated by the condition she was struggling with. And within about eight weeks, the majority of all those symptoms she thought was coming from her autoimmune disease went away completely. So no matter how bad you feel, your diet and if you're carrying excess weight is going to make it feel so much worse. You know, one of the things I didn't mention, one of the hormones that is secreted by the belly fat is called interleukin-6. And interleukin-6 is a real major inflammatory hormone. So it's going to promote all of those things. And if you've got an autoimmune condition, it's just putting gasoline on the fire. Uh, for men, it secretes a hormone called aromatase, which takes their testosterone and converts it into estrogen. So a guy who's carrying around belly fat is going to have low testosterone and higher estrogen levels. And, you know, that's not good. And then they keep putting the fat on in their chest, throat and face, and they have risk of high blood pressure and sleep apnea. So it's all linked together and people can make big changes in their health quickly with small steps. So. I, I, I say all of this to be positive and let folks know that there's hope to make change. Yeah. And I love the trend that we're on right now in this industry with changing your life with nutrition, because it used to be, you know, take this pill, take this magic drug, like let's, let's get you on this medication. And mm -hmm. that's what all the doctors were pushing. And thanks to doctors like you, it's like, people are seeing there is another way there's another way that I can fit this into my life forever and it's going to be easier mm -hmm. and it's going to make me feel better and perform better. And I love that so much that we're seeking out solutions with just proper nutrition and exercise. Um, I want to go back to talking about that visceral fat. Mm -hmm. And I know many of our listeners are probably thinking, well, how can I find out how much visceral fat I have in my body? How do you find that out? Yeah, that's a great question. So the best thing there's a there's a newer scan and I'm I'm learning about this so I'm not an expert where to go specifically but there is a scan that you can get that does a cross sectional view of your visceral fat so that is something new and interesting you can also get a DEXA scan and a DEXA scan can measure it we measure it with a body composition scale in our office for our local clients that's within five percent accuracy so at least we know where it is. And most often, you know, I'll be able to tell how much excess fat weight and our nutritionists can tell how much excess fat weight a person is carrying by their height, their before images, so we can see where they carry that fat. I always mm -hmm. ask them where they feel they've got the most pockets of fat and where they're carrying that if it's primarily in the belly or not. So even if you don't get a scan or you can't get a scan, there are some scales that measure it by body composition or just talking about it with a knowledgeable person, nutritionist who can help you determine about how much excess fat weight you've got. And you can tell when you start to get rid of it because there's a lot of physiology areas that change, like the way that your nails look, the color of your skin, some aspects mm. associated with your eyes, um, your hair, all of these markers that are crazy start to change as you release and drop that belly fat. That's amazing. And now that you're saying that, so I have had, you know, two children, you have three children, yeah. right? And it's crazy to think back on that postpartum journey where, you know, you just had a baby, your body doesn't look anything like it used to. And I did notice like my skin, like a year later, my skin was different. Everything about me was different. My, the texture of my hair, because mm -hmm. I had started to muscle again, lose that baby weight, really start taking care of myself. And you do have like a total transformation. It's not just like, you know, the, the weight, but it's like every little piece, you do notice a yeah, difference. Totally. It's crazy. So something I just thought about, and this is very much off script was, you know, what you're doing now and how you're helping people and your approach to nutrition and diet as a lifestyle. And the way you used to think back when you were a professional dancer, what, what is something that like you would have told 
20 year old you about what you know now? Oh my gosh. My career would have been longer. I'm glad that it wasn't because it got me here and I'm so passionate about what I do. But so many things. I was so preoccupied with with calories. I my brain was so much more accurate than my fitness pal. I mean, I could count every little <laughs> calorie in anything. I knew, I knew it all. And, and now I don't worry about it at all. I used to think about food. It was like, when am I going to eat next? I was hungry all the time. I remember my days off, I would have like Sunday off if we were performing. And I just was like waiting for the next time to eat and always never, ever satiated. And that's yeah. because of how I ate the types of food that I ate that I thought were good, you know, like rice cakes and all of these uh, and popcorn and all these lower calorie foods and processed foods. That's right. That, that were diet. Um, now I, my favorite thing is heavy cream. I love fat. I, um, you know, always put fat in whatever I'm eating. I feared it before. So I would eat, you know, soy milk or Luna bars or Lara bars. I mean, all these things that had no fat in it. So if I had just not been preoccupied with calories and I had, if I could have thought about how food came to us, like if I ate an egg back then, I'd probably eat just an egg white. Mm -hmm. And I will never do that now because the yolk is actually where all the vitamins and minerals are, all the good things. So I was probably nutritionally starved and yeah. I had high, I had high sugar levels. I was pre-diabetic and I had high cholesterol and I was a young dancer dancing all the time. So, oh my gosh. And I would have told myself, do not go to the gym after an eight hour day of dancing. And if you do go to the gym, lift weights, don't get on the elliptical machine. So those are just a few things. <laughs> Gosh, I love it so much. And it's just crazy. It sounds like to me that you probably take a much more intuitive, mindful approach to eating now, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Like it's more about how you feel, how it tastes, not so much about, you know, oh, well, does this have a hundred calories or less? Because yeah. a lot of people get stuck in that cycle of, of just counting calories, like you mentioned. That's right. And, and this is what I want for my clients too, is to be able to trust the feelings and sensations that our body is giving us. Mm. Before how I used to eat, I, I couldn't trust if I was hungry or full because the foods that I ate drove cravings and overeating. So it was like I, ha I didn't have clear signals. And a lot of my clients who come in, they don't know when they're hungry. They don't know the difference between hunger or cravings. They don't know when they're full. And it's not their fault. It's because metabolically, the, their food, the foods they're eating and their visceral fat is just giving them all of these off signals. So yeah. if you can't trust yourself and, and listen to what your body's telling you, it's like the computer system is off, then you've got no navigation. You're just meandering out there all on your own with all of these sensations kind of playing tricks on you. So the yeah. ultimate goal is for us to be able to get that metabolism in alignment, to calm everything down so that when you're hungry, your body says you're hungry. And it's like a calm tap on the shoulder, like you could eat at some point. It's a dull yeah. hunger. It's not like this, oh my gosh, I could eat a cow right now. And I don't care what it is, but you got it. The hangry, no one should be hangry. If you're hangry, it's a sign that you're not eating right for your body and something is off. Mm, so I so love. that's the ultimate goal. That's why I'm not a huge fan of a tracker because, but I understand why we use them. It's because we all, we're, we're haywire. Everything's out there. So we need a, a computer to tell us what to do, but we shouldn't have to do that. Our body has a beautiful system within it if we can just get it back there and then learn how to listen to it. Yeah, that's such a great point. I've been through periods and stages in my life where I've tracked my food or I've tracked my macros, tracked my calories. And I often find that once I get so far into that, I then become obsessed with when am I eating next? What What is that meal going to look like? And I'm just thinking about it all the time. Yeah. And I'm so much happier when I'm not doing that. And mm -hmm. even looking back, you know, in both of my postpartum journeys, having my children, like I wanted at first to say like, okay, I'm going to track everything. I'm going to track my exercise. I really want to get this weight off. But looking back, I was so much happier when I just gave myself some grace and did not do that because it just mm -hmm. stressed me out more. And we all know that like stress is not going to help you lose weight. And no. so I think 
you know, I think it can be a great tool in the beginning for some people, but it can control you if you let it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a, a good tool to set you on track, get you back in alignment with amounts and what your meals should look like. Definitely. But then at some period, you've got to be able to listen to yourself. Right. Right. So I want to ask, what are some of the habits of your own personal daily protocol that you do to keep you on track with your own health and fitness? Yeah. So um, what I do in the morning is really important to me and I meditate. I think that that's a great tool and it's made huge changes in my life and that's a non-negotiable for me. So every morning, right when I get up, I get up before the kids and I meditate mm -hmm. And then getting outside and seeing the sun and walking, if I can, in nature and in the forest, uh, that helps to set your circadian rhythm. And for me, I work a lot and I'm inside a lot. So being able to get out there and hear the sounds of nature and feel the sun and see the sun is important to me. Um, I always drink about 30 ounces of water with lemon in it right when I wake up because I do go all day. And some days I'm not great at drinking water throughout the day. So I know I've got to get that in there. And then, then it starts my day right. And I know, and I'm more aware of drinking water throughout the day. And then getting 30 grams of protein for my first meal to set me up for success for my eating is really key. So I don't necessarily eat breakfast. I'm not a huge breakfast eater, but I do make sure the first meal that I eat has that 30 grams of protein in it because research shows that the first meal you eat and the last meal you eat is the most important meals for muscle synthesis and to support your muscles. So I make sure I do that as well. Awesome. I love it. And what about like fitness? How do, what is your fitness routine? Just walking in the morning or no, I have, I have an hour set on my schedule every day at 11. And sometimes awesome. I, I have to schedule things during it, but pretty much I would say six days a week, I, I keep that. And it includes, I'm not, I used to be like this huge cyclist and I'd cycle 250 miles a week and I would do centuries and all of that, but that was exhausting to my body. And I'm, I'm healing my adrenals. I feel like my daily life is, is a marathon. <laughs> and so when I work out, yeah. I lift weights. I love going, um, to, you know, burn camps like fit body. I think that, uh, that is a really great way to work out. Cause you guys include the, uh, the high intensity intervals, which is key yeah. and the resistance training together. So I try to go do that. I love that because I don't have to think about it. But if I'm on my own, I lift weights and then I might do a few kind of sprints on the bike, but that's about it. Walk up hills, stuff like that. <laughs> I love it. Well, I want to leave our guest today with this one last question for you. And I ask all of my guests this, and that is what does beyond the scale mean to you? What is living a life beyond just a metric, a number on the scale mean for you? Well, we kind of talked about it earlier. For me, it really is just being able to be in tune with my body and listen to what it's telling me. I never get on the scale. Um, I don't want my clients to be pre preoccupied with it. It's just being confident in yourself, um, being confident with your body, even if it doesn't look like the perfect person next to you. It's about not comparing yourself to others and being happy and satisfied and grateful with the body that you've been given, but also taking responsibility to keep the one body that you have been given for the rest of your life in the best shape possible, because no one can do that but us. And I, I, I would just say, continuing to grow and learn and to every time I eat, it's okay. How is this, this thing that I'm eating serving me? How is it making me stronger? How is it supporting my, my brain and the vita vitality that I want thinking about how food impacts me, not just now, but also later down the road. And I've got three kids and I want to Someday I'll probably have grandkids and don't want to be on medications. I want to be there with them. So we've got to think about um, the now and the later. So I would say that's what beyond the scale means to me. I love that vitality and longevity for life. It's amazing. That's right. Well, Dr. Ashley, I know that you have a podcast of your own. What is, what is your podcast so our listeners can find you? 
Yeah, it's called The Dr. Ashley Show. Uh, my website is called myphdweightloss.com. Um, we're on Instagram and Facebook. If you just look up Dr. Dr. Underscore Ashley Lucas, you can follow us there. Um, and we try to post great content and tips. And that's what you know, our, my podcast is all about fitness and fat loss, metabolism, longevity, mindset. It's a lot of fun. So I do hope that you join. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I know that our listeners um, are going to get incredible value out of this episode. And as always, please make sure for our listeners that you subscribe to our Fit Body Bootcamp YouTube channel, where we have Beyond the Scale as a um, playlist on the channel. We're also on Apple Podcast and Spotify. So thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Beyond the Scale. And until next time. Mm -hmm.